Welcome everybody to the second video in class 15. In the last video we looked at the record of glacial interglacials, but we weren't able to understand what causes those glacial interglacial climate cycles. So in this video we want to pick up on some of the forcings and feedbacks that influence Earth's climate system and ask the question of whether they might be able to explain some of the past climate transitions and also modern climate change. So the same forcings and feedbacks we'll talk about today are also really important in thinking about modern climate change. So recall from the last video, in the last million years, we've had roughly 10 glacial interglacial cycles. They happen about every 100,000 years. And what we know about these is they're big changes in ice volume, big changes in sea level. What we don't know in particular is what causes them. Um, and so that's what we're going to look at in this video. Now in, in the past we've looked at Earth's energy budget and of course just to remind you we can think of it as this this energy system where energy comes in from the Sun. Uh, some is reflected right away off of Earth's surface or off Earth's atmosphere but other energy is absorbed by the surface. It heats that surface um, and then it has radiative exchange with the atmosphere um, and then also drives other mechanisms of heat exchange like evaporation and uh, convection of air masses in the atmosphere. So we've got this climate system that's kind of filtering energy through and then ultimately sending that energy back out to space. And recall that the temperature of Earth uh, might be changed in two different ways. Uh, one way we've talked about is if we just increase the energy fluxing through the system, then, then we're going to have to raise the, the temperature of the atmosphere a little bit to accommodate that additional energy going in and out. But also we can change the system internally. We could increase greenhouse gases and, and kind of prevent some of this radiation from escaping, uh, some of this radiation from escaping, um, and that would change the system and cause the whole thing to warm as well. So we've got a few different knobs that we can play with in order to try to make Earth's climate warmer or colder. Um, and in particular, we'll look at the couple of these in the lecture. We'll look at what happens if we can change incoming radiation. So that would be this term. Um, or what happens if we change surface reflectivity. So that would be over here, the amount of energy reflected by surface. So that's pretty much where we're going in the video. We'll look at incoming solar radiation, then we'll look at uh, surface reflectivity. And throughout the video, we're also going to develop the theme of forcings and feedbacks. So changes in solar radiation will be an example of a forcing, something external to the system. And changes in reflectivity will be an example of a feedback, uh, something internal to the system. And we'll review that at the end as well. So we think of insulation changes as an external forcing. And as soon as climate records were developed, people noticed that they were cyclical. There was something cyclical about climate change. And right away that suggested people to people that there could have been a cyclical forcing, something from the outside that was changing in a regular way. And people knew, of course, that orbits, uh, the Earth-Sun orbit is something that changes in a cyclical way. <clears throat> and it turns out that these uh, cyclical changes in the Earth-Sun orbit do have pretty important impacts on uh, the pattern of insulation, of solar insulation that Earth receives. And these patterns or changes are called Milankovitch cycles. So if you want to Google Milankovitch cycles, you can read a lot about this. And so the way this works is that there's really three things about the Earth-Sun relationship that are changing. One is called the eccentricity. And that's literally the shape of Earth's orbit around the Sun. It goes from being more of an, an oval to being more of a circle. The next thing is the tilt. This is a change in literally the tilt axis of the Earth from a little bit more tilted to a little bit less tilted, like that. 
And the third thing is the precession. So obviously, Earth is spinning on this tilted axis. But it's also wobbling, just the way that a top might wobble just before it falls over. So although it's still spinning around this axis, the direction of the axis itself is also actually rotating around. So it might point in one direction for a while and then change to pointing in the other direction. So Earth is kind of wobbling just like a spinning top before it topples over. So these three effects obviously change the, the pattern of solar insulation on Earth. Eccentricity pretty much just changes the seasonal intensity. If Earth was making a perfect circle around the sun, then the amount of solar intensity would be the same each season. If it's making a, a stronger ellipse, it will get a little bit less insulation when it's far away, and a little bit more insulation when it's close. So that's eccentricity. What tilt does is it changes the seasonal distribution of insulation at the poles versus the equator. So when Earth is tilted more directly towards the sun, that means that in summer, the northern hemisphere will get even more solar insulation. But then in winter, it will get even less. So the more the tilt is, um, the more intense the seasonal differences are between insulation, um, in the, in the, especially in the northern and southern hemispheres. Now precession, all this does is actually change what month the different seasons occur in. So basically, if the tilt's not changing, but the tilt direction is changing, then it basically just changes which point in the orbit the sun is point uh, the earth is pointing towards or away from the sun but it doesn't actually change the magnitude of that tilt so a couple key points about this one these milankovitch cycles don't actually change the average annual insulation delivered to earth that's constant regardless so that average insulation is, is the same for the most part. But they have a strong effect on the spatial and temporal pattern. So it really affects when and where that sun's energy hits Earth. But it doesn't affect the total amount that's hitting Earth. Another point is that we almost always consider insulation at a point on Earth. because it does average out spatially. So we usually need to specify where we're talking about insulation. In this case, we'll often talk about it in terms of roughly 65 degree north latitude. And the final point is that although the average annual insulation might be constant, these seasonal spatial and temporal changes can actually trigger pretty important climate changes. So let's look more closely at that. Um, what we're seeing here is uh, in solar insulation at 65 degree north. Okay, So this is at one point in the northern hemisphere. And here's how precession is changing. Here's how tilt is changing. And here's how eccentricity is changing. And now if we sum up all those changes on top of each other, it gives us the net solar forcing at 65 degree north over the last 1 million years. And so a couple things we can see here. One, those changes are pretty big. So there is a pretty big difference in the, the solar forcing at 65 degree north in the summer. But the other thing is that it obviously doesn't perfectly match up with glacial stages. Um, there's not a perfect match between these. This seems to be changing at, in particular, a higher frequency than the 100,000 year glacial interglacial cycle. But one thing people do see is that uh, the onset of glacial periods, so these points when Earth starts to, to slip into a glacial period, seem to correspond with steep drops in that northern hemisphere forcing. So it seems that 
a drop in northern hemisphere solar forcing is tightly correlated to the onset of glacial periods. But obviously, we also see that as northern hemisphere insulation goes back up, Earth still goes into a glacial period. So there's obviously something else going on. And the idea is that this change in northern hemisphere insulation uh, triggers a perturbation or a forcing of the system. But then feedbacks are required to actually pull Earth's temperature deeper into that glacial period. So what we want to focus on now is what feedbacks might be necessary to pull us into that deeper glacial period. A great example of that is the surface reflectivity feedback, or as it's commonly known, the, the ice reflectivity feedback. And the way this works is we might start out with some outside forcing, like stronger local insulation in the northern hemisphere. And that might give us a longer period of melting in the summer. So it might be warmer, we might melt more snow and ice. Um, that's going to give us less overall snow and ice cover. And as that ice pulls back, it exposes bare earth. And the bare earth has a much lower reflectivity than the ice. It tends to absorb sun's radiation instead of reflect it. And that extra absorption of the solar radiation further warms the land surface, which then feeds back, makes everything warmer, and continues to melt more ice. So this is the ice reflectivity feedback. And what you can see is that once you get it started with a change in insulation, it actually builds on itself. And you get melting, you get more absorption, more warmth, and then more melting. So this is how a simple change in local insulation might actually lead to a full-on glacial period, even if the insulation actually weakens or changes later. It might be that this feedback has already run away, basically, and already kicked you into an ice age or out of an ice age. So it's also important to consider why we're so concerned with the northern hemisphere when we think about changes in insulation and the ice reflectivity feedback. The reason is because all the land mass is in the northern hemisphere. So the equator runs something like this. No, I guess the equator is down here. Um, so overwhelmingly, something like you know 80% of the land mass is in the northern hemisphere. And that's important for two reasons. One, we need that land surface to be able to absorb the solar radiation and be able to drive the ice reflectivity feedback. And also, we need ice sheets to be on land. So without land, we can't have big ice sheets. Um, so basically, we need those land masses to have a functioning ice reflectivity feedback. And that's why we think changes in northern hemisphere insulation are what may get us into glacial periods. And I'll just finish that with an illustration of Greenland. This is the Greenland ice cap. Um, you could imagine what would happen if we melted all this ice and changed it to brown uh, earth. That would be a lot less solar energy reflected back into space and uh, would have a net warming effect on Earth. So to finish this video, I just want to summarize the difference between a forcing and a feedback, because this is a really important concept that will keep coming back in this class and beyond. So a forcing is defined as something that is external to the system. Like when we change that insulation, that's something that's happening outside of Earth's energy budget. It's just governed by the orbits. And it's kind of a one-time thing. Just changes, and then that's it. Although it can change back also, of course. A feedback is much different. A feedback is an internal response of the system. So something changes the system, gives us a perturbation. So in this case, insulation might change. And then within the system, there's this internal response that either accelerates or slows the initial perturbation. If it accelerates the perturbation, 
it's called a positive feedback. If it slows the perturbation, it's called a negative feedback. So definitely take note of that. A positive feedback would accelerate the perturbation. A negative feedback would slow the perturbation. So I'll leave you with this concept question. There's no quiz for this video. And I'll see you shortly for our final video called uh, The Carbon Cycle and Global Climate. Thanks.